What I'd like to do tonight is to basically give you an overview of why a geologist like myself uh, would write three books about soil and its importance in human history and what we, I think, need to do to actually maintain the continuity of uh, successful agricultural civilizations. Um, in fact, this, uh, this trilogy of books about soil, that dirt one, is the one that looks backwards and looks at the definition of the problem of how we've treated land through the ages. The middle one, The Hidden Half of Nature, that I wrote with my wife, a biologist, Anne Buclay, looks at the role of microbial life in building soil fertility, sort of how it works um, in terms of soil fertility. And the third one, Growing a Revolution, was the, the more optimistic, forward-looking um, book that looks at how we can actually try and address and solve the problems that I identified 10 years ago in that first book, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations. If anyone wants to live tweet this, that's our tw Twitter handle. I encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, but the big reason why a geologist like myself would think to put so much time into thinking about the soil as opposed to rocks is partly I'm that kind of geologist that works on the surface of the earth. I'm a geomorphologist, someone who studies the evolution of topography. And most of the world's surface is covered by soil. You get up into the high alpine regions, and you get out of the above timberline, and you get out of the world of soil. You go to the glaciated regions and the poles, you're out of the world of soil. But most of the world in the temperate zones and the tropics is covered by some layer of soil that I was taught in college to basically dig below it to look at the rocks, because that's what I was training to look at. And the more that I looked at this, uh, the more I became to realize that in studying soil erosion around the world as a geologist, the fundamental linkages between the way that people treat their land, how their soil will then be able to treat them over the long run. And if you look at the, the UN's map of global soil degradation today, which is uh, up on the screen at the moment, um, it basically paints a fairly bleak picture. There's an awful lot of that orange and that red color, degraded soils and very degraded soils. And if you, if you look around the world with the sort of the thick fuzzy glasses of a geologist, an awful lot of the world's soils, ag our, ag our agricultural soils, have been degraded to some degree that has impacted agricultural production. Different parts of the world to different degrees, and to be fair, in every one of those red zones that you see on the map there, there are farms that are actually building fertile soil. We'll get back to that later. Uh, but this is painting with a very broad brush. We're actually in not very good shape in terms of our global stock of fertile soil. How bad is that? Well, these two studies are the ones that I like to use to actually sort of put numbers on things. And if you look at an assessment that David Pimentel and his colleagues at Cornell University put forward back in 1995, they estimated that over the 40 years between the Second World War and the time they wrote their paper, um, that soil erosion had caused and degradation had caused the abandonment of some 430 million hectares of farmland worldwide. That's an awful lot of land. That's an area about the size of China and India combined, and it amounts to about one-third of all present cropland. And if you think about any way you cut, any way you slice the problem of feeding the world of tomorrow, it simply would be easier to feed everybody if we had all the world's original agricultural soils at their full native productive capacity. Another way to look at that is what's sort of happening today and for forecasting into the future. And uh, two years ago, the UN put together a, a global state of the soil assessment where they estimated that humanity is losing about a third of a percent of our global food production capacity each year to soil erosion and degradation. And you don't have to be a geologist to do the math in your head to look forward like, oh, in 100 years, that means we would have lost almost a third of our remaining productive capacity for agriculture. In other words, it's going to become progressively harder for us to feed the world of the future if we continue with agricultural practices that degrade the productive capacity of our land base. Uh, and it's in that spirit that I basically will argue to you over the course of this talk that we need to rethink and change the way that we're thinking about agriculture because I actually think we can solve these problems, and I'll get there. Um, but this is not where I started. I started with a backwards look at the history of soil erosion in the course and fate of human civilizations that Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations book that got me started in thinking about soils. And when I started working on that, I wasn't thinking about writing a history of farming. That is, in the end, what I actually wrote. <laughs> But what I started in thinking about is trying to take archaeological evidence and merge that with geology to try and look at what role soil erosion had played in human history and in past civilizations. And in part because I wanted to learn the archaeology, I thought it was really cool. I had a professor as an undergrad who taught a little bit of geoarchaeology, sort of whetted my appetite for these kind of things. And I'd read a book that some of you may have heard about called Topsoil and Civilization that was written by some soil conservation service scientists back in the 1950s. I found it in the bargain bin at Stanford when I was 
an undergrad, it was like a dollar, so I could afford it after tuition there. And it was fairly, it was an amazing read because it basically argued that one of humanity's most valuable resources was fertile soil. It was the state of the land and its ability to support agriculture and therefore our ability to feed ourselves and to be able to have people like myself not be farmers and be professors because someone else is growing the food that feeds us. It's been central to the, our, our history, you know, post the development of agriculture, that agriculture be successful at a very large scale. And I was very intrigued with the, with the role that soil erosion had played in compromising that success. And in looking into the history of soil erosion in societies around the world, I really noticed that, that there was a, the same story, in effect, repeated in society after society. And that soil erosion played a role in the demise of ancient civilizations, you know, going back cl clear to Mesopotamia and Neolithic Europe or Bronze Age Europe, classical Greece, Rome, the southern United States, which is a story I was never taught in either high school or college, uh, the, the, the Mayan civilization, Central America, societies in Asia, and more. I could go really down the list, which I tried to do in the dirt book because I was trying to be, I was in that phase of my career, was I trying to be very comprehensive. Uh, and I thought I was on to an interesting story in how the role of soil erosion affected society after society. And I wanted to dig through the data, the examples, to try and see whether or not the idea that I was um, uh, playing with actually had legs, whether it, it penciled out. And I'll share with you some of the, that data, but let me give away the punchline. You know, if a nonfiction book can have a villain, the villain of the dirt book was the plow. And that is something that is, you know, it's a little jarring to hear in terms of thinking about agriculture. I mean, you look at the seal of the U.S. Department of Agriculture today and Thomas Jefferson's plow is still on it. You know, you think about farming or listen to country music and what do farmers do? They plow. This is the sort of iconic activity of agriculture. Um, and yet, in looking back through this history of society after society, I could basically paint a picture um, with substantial independent support that the invention of the plow fundamentally altered the balance between soil production and soil erosion on those lands that we use to derive our living, to grow our food, and that it had so increased the pace of soil erosion that given enough time, which to a geologist, you know, a hundred years is not much, a thousand years isn't all that more. I mean, if you have enough time to play with, if you're eroding your soil faster than you're building it, you're actually losing it. It's a, I like to use the analogy of one's bank account. If you spend money faster than you, than you make money, you are burning through your savings. And if, as I have done several times, you complete that process, uh, you know, you're, you're left with nothing in the bank. Um, this is how I started graduate school. <laughs> um, and actually how I ended graduate school. So <laughs> maybe there's not a message to the graduate students here, but um, this is a fairly simple analogy if you think in terms of soil as natural capital, that societies that build their stock of natural capital and invest in the health and fertility of their land are building natural capital. Those that are erode through their soil and its fertility are essentially burning up their natural capital. And so if you think of the soil as a system that can be grown and can be squandered, you're starting to think about soil the way a geologist would. And I'll cut through the sort of many historical examples that I go through in the dirt book to basically tell the story of the, the American Southeast, because this is a story that was central to the development of our nation as a country that I was never taught the connection to soil erosion and farming practices in any of the history courses I took as a, well, in high school or in, as an undergrad. And this shows you a map of the Piedmont region of the Southeast. So it's the hill country stretching from Virginia up there in the upper right down to Alabama in the lower left. And what it shows you is the magnitude of historical historical soil erosion since the advent of colonial agriculture um, in the early American colony. And notice that all that gray area, that big noodle that splashes across the map, that's four to ten inches of topsoil loss over the course of the last couple hundred years. That black area is more than ten inches. And you can basically see that the whole Piedmont region has had at least four inches and up to almost a foot of soil erosion in a few centuries. How big a deal was that? There was only about 12 inches of fertile black earth in this area to begin with. And so if we could erode through a third to virtually all of the topsoil across a pretty broad swath of the original breadbasket or one of the original breadbaskets of this country, think what the Romans could have done with a with 500-year run at central Italy. Think of what the classical Greeks could have done with a 1,000-year run at, at southern Greece. You know, the idea that long-term erosion under plow-based agriculture, tillage-associated erosion, um, that that could actually strip the soil off of a landscape in a way that could impoverish a, a civilization well into the future starts to become not such a crazy idea. 
And for sort of independent confirmation of the sort of the, the potential of that, look to areas around the world today that are perpetual trouble spots in societies that actually went through this process long before the United States was even imagined. I'm talking, of course, about Syria and Libya, places where there are Roman tax records that document very high harvests of wheat shipped back to central Rome. Why was that important in Rome's day? Because the, the, um, the Romans had already eroded the soils off of central Italy, and feeding the Roman populace was utterly dependent on the grain shipments from the colonies. There's this whole long history of essentially societies plowing through their fertile soil and then moving on to fresh new ground. And this is exactly what um, the young United States did. Because in the early um, 19th century, the early 1800s, there was a great migration of people from the eastern seaboard inboard uh, that um, was essentially foretold, if you will, uh, or predicted by characters like George Washington back in the late 18th century. He recognized the role of colonial agricultural practices in degrading the soils of the American Southeast to the degree that farmers there were routinely complaining about how depressed their yields were relative to what their grandfathers had had, had um, that they had essentially degraded their land. And Washington wrote in a, in a 1796 letter to Alexander Hamilton complaining of this very um, problem in the Ameri um, in the young country, that a few more years of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support, whereas if they were taught how to improve the old, instead of going in pursuit of new and productive soils, they would make these acres which now scarcely yield them anything turn out beneficial to themselves. What Washington was commenting on was essentially the degraded state of soils along the eastern seaboard, particularly in the Virginias and the Carolinas. And he was predicting that the future of America as a country lay in moving across the Appalachians to, to try and take advantage of the fresh soils on the other side of the mountains, or the other side of the frontier at that point. And recall that this is long before any kind of discussion of you know, westward migrations and manifest destiny, the things that historians have reverse engineered to help explain things. There was a very simple motivation for an awful lot of the westward migration in its earliest days, and that was the soils on the eastern seaboard had been very degraded, and we were an agricultural nation. Um, what does this look like? Well, if you go to farms in North Carolina today in the Piedmont country, the hill country, uh, and you dig into a, uh, the field of a tobacco plantation, which I did over there on the right, that's the kind of soil that they're basically growing stuff in. Uh, notice that it looks a lot like beach sand. Uh, the, na the geology there is effectively beach sand. There's not much organic matter in it. It's less than a percent. Um, it's, it's hard. It crusts up the way that, that wonderful demonstration uh, showed us uh, a few moments ago. But if you go dig a hole in the forest right near, next door, nearby, which has had 100 years of recovery from colonial agriculture, you see a completely different kind of soil. The soil type is the same. The parent material is the same. The difference is the role of vegetation and the treatment of the land. The stuff on the left is full of organic matter, um, and it's much more fertile. Um, and I basically um, made this demonstration uh, and thought about the white tablecloth because I was approached by um, a, a public television show that was basically running a three-part series on the geological evolution of North America. And I got a call late in the game saying, Dave, we've, we, we've kind of forgot about soil, and we need to do something that takes no more than about three minutes to illustrate the history of soil in the United States. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> um, that's kind of a tall order for three minutes. Uh, when, but when it came down to it, I thought that comparing what happened to the soils on the eastern seaboard is really kind of the microcosm for what's happened on agricultural soils around the country. Because the latest estimate that I've read um, basically suggests that we've lost about half of the organic matter in America's agricultural soils averaged across the entire country. Um, and in some places, like the Piedmont in North Carolina, uh, we've managed to farm off the entire topsoil. I mean, there are farms that I've visited there where farmers are, are plowing and working the subsoil because the topsoil is literally gone. For those soil scientists in the room, they're really actually farming the B horizon. There's no O or A horizon left. Um, now, I'm going to pick up my home state of Washington for a minute here because this, this slide basically illustrates to you why a geologist like myself would look at uh, what I call conventional agriculture or plow-based agriculture, full-on tillage, as something that is long-term very destructive to the landscape. This is a winter wheat field in uh, eastern Washington. It's in the Palouse country, for those of you familiar with Washington. So it's, it's beautiful loose soil, but um, you'll notice all those little channels that are cut into it. 
Uh, this is a wheat field that is obviously hasn't sprouted back out with the new crop, and it illustrates the danger of conventional plow-based agriculture uh, in any place in the world where it rains, which, and it's hard to find agriculture in places where it doesn't rain. Um, and all those little channels could be erased with a single pass of the plow. Uh, they're easy to rework. Um, but the problem is, of course, is if that happens every year, year after year, it really adds up. And this slide basically illustrates that problem. That, that fence row up there in the upper right-hand corner uh, is a fence that the farmer um, who uh, worked this field, which again was a winter wheat field that had a wheat fallow rotation. Um, in 1911, when the ground was first um, plowed, the, it was up at that upper orange bar, um, and the farmer built a fence line around his water cistern because he didn't want to plow over his water supply. Uh, and the only thing that's happened in that field for the 50 years after this, until the picture was taken in 1961, was those annual rains basically produce little rills like we were just showing you, that, and the plow itself pushed soil downhill and away from the fence line. And I don't know if you can see, there's a little dark uh, uh, um, line on the negative just to the right of that 1961. It doesn't show up real well, but that's a five foot high cliff. There's a stadia rod in the negative and the dark bit is a one foot interval on it. So what this shows you is that on this particular field, over the course of 50 years, the farmer lost five feet of soil. That's about a foot every decade, about an inch every year, and I can assure you, and we'll show you data in a moment, that there is nowhere on earth that soils naturally form at a pace of an inch a year. That's an incredible rate of soil loss. Uh, and you should also be sitting there thinking of like, well, yeah, but that's extreme. How typical is this? That's exactly the right question to be asking because the reason I'm showing it to you is it is extreme and not typical. <laughs> it's a really good teaching device that we actually can, through plow-based agriculture, lose topsoil at an incredibly rapid pace. But that doesn't mean that this pace applies everywhere. So what did I do to try and sort that out? Well, of course, I went to the library. And I started to vacuum up data on what are paces of soil erosion, what are the natural rates of soil formation, and uh, what are the long-term rates of geological erosion. Because in the long term, geological erosion rates must be about balanced by soil production rates. Otherwise, the world would either be stripped bare of soil or buried under soil. Because once you start dealing with geologic time, if you have any kind of imbalance, it's going to run away because of the magnitude, the gross magnitude of geologic time. You run anything for millions of years, and it adds up to a really big effect. So I basically went to the library and started compiling data. And I'm going to show you two slides full of data. The first one has the sort of the, 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 the most data on it. I'll unpack it and walk you through it, and then the second one will summarize it. Um, and if anyone's really interested in all the data behind this, I put out a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that has all the data in it in an Excel spreadsheet. Nobody should ever have to redo this analysis. Just take my data. If you want to update this, take the data and start from there. Download that spreadsheet. Um, so what did I do? I basically uncovered about 1,400 studies that had measurements of both agricultural erosion rates worldwide um, in both conventional tillage-based agriculture and also in no-till agriculture. And I also found long-term rates of geological erosion rates. Um, and the graph here is a, a one-dimensional graph. So the only dimension that really matters is that x-axis. And it shows you rates of soil erosion and what the vertical columns of data are, the, the rows of data, that just shows you different types of data. So they're stacked vertically to allow you to compare them visually. The, the operative dimension is the horizontal one. And notice that each of those cycles that's labeled is a factor of 10. So it's a logarithmic scale. It's just like the earthquake magnitude scale. Each one of those steps over increases by a factor of 10. And all those sort of white data points are long-term rates of geological erosion which translate roughly into long-term rates of soil formation. And I'll show you a little bit more data on that in a minute. Um, but the, the cratons, the, that lower level, is something that are tectonically quiescent parts of continents. So you could think most of Australia, the, the most of Africa, uh, outside of the rift zone that really um, kicked our uh, species along, um, much of the American Midwest. It would not be places like where I live in Seattle, where we have massively destructive earthquakes every few hundred years. Um, or at least we hope they're every few hundred years. <laughs> um, so those cratons erode at a pace that gets up to about a tenth of a millimeter a year. That's really slow. It's actually really hard to measure something that happens that slowly. Um, if we look at so soil erosion rates in the soil-mantled world, that gets up to about a millimeter a year over on the right-hand side. That's the part of the world that we tend to farm. 
uh, the rolling hills of Tennessee, areas around here, uh, out in the hills of California, that range of, you know, 1% of a millimeter a year to a millimeter a year. That's kind of what soil mantle terrain tends to erode at. The places that erode at paces higher than a millimeter a year are alpine and glaciated terrain. Places like the Andes, the Himalaya, um, the Cascade Range, um, real high steep mountains, not the places we tend to think of as places we would prefer to farm. And of course, people farm in the Himalaya, but that's because they live in the Himalaya and they have no other land. It is all steep there. Um, and so if you then look at those black data points up at the top, it's labeled agriculture. Uh, that is conventional plow-based agriculture. And it's from societies around the world, different levels of technological sophistication. The common element is reliance on disturbance of the soil as a part of the planting regimen. And if you play the game of sort of which of those um, uh, geological rates modern plow-based agriculture is more like, you come to the conclusion that conventionally plowed farms erode like alpine topography. The average is somewhere over there around a millimeter a year. So if you think about that in terms of soil erosion, we've managed to turn places that are relatively flat into places that are eroding like the high Himalaya. This is something that really impressed me as a geologist. That is a global pattern that humanity has imposed on the surface of the earth in the process of growing our food. Um, and it also leads to the conclusion that conventional agriculture is unsustainable in soil-mantled landscapes. You look at that distribution of the middle bar and the cratons, the places we actually grow our food, they are to the left of most of that data from contemporary um, tillage-based agriculture. Um, so what does this mean if we boil this down to global averages? Uh, this is the second data slide that I promised to show you, and this is where we can really start to... Um, uh, carry that forward. I mean, one of the messages of the last slide is that soil erosion rates are pretty variable. They range by orders of magnitude around the world and even within different geologic categories or within um, the plow-based agriculture. But if we look at the averages, and so we have up here, up at the top, that red number is the average erosion rate, the median erosion rate for the studies that looked at conventional tillage-based agriculture. And the numbers in parentheses on each of these entries are simply the number of academic studies that were averaged to produce that number. Um, that red number is about a millimeter and a half per year on average. And so if you look at the average rate at which our farmland soils around the world are shedding their topsoil, it's about a millimeter and a half per year. Now, if you look at the rate that your fingernails grow, it's about an order of magnitude faster than that. <laughs> you know, these are slow numbers, unless you have a lot of time to work with. And if you look at the, the erosion rates for no-till agriculture, those, the, it's you know, less than a tenth of a millimeter a year. Long-term rates of soil production, long-term geological erosion rates that are uh, constrained by independent methods are also, you know, they're closer to 1% of a millimeter a year. Erosion rates under natural vegetation are down below a tenth of a percent of a millimeter a year. I'm not going to argue to you that any of those blue numbers, with this kind of a coarse analysis, I can argue that they're very different from one another. The point I want to make is that they are all an order of magnitude or two lower than the rate of conventional soil erosion off of plowed fields. And therein lies both the bad news and the good news. The bad news is that we're eroding our soil faster than it's reforming. The good news is that second tier blue number, erosion rates under no-till agriculture, they are actually pretty darn close to the long-term rates of soil production. So the bad news is not that we've been, that we farm, and you know, to argue that, would be, you know, that would be a very depressing message to be delivering. But the problem is how we've been farming, that we've been causing erosion of the very resource that we depend on to be able to maintain our ability to farm. And if you actually take that, that long-term net soil loss of about a millimeter a year or so, and you play that out over time, and take, uh, uh, do the sort of the back of the envelope kind of calculation that you can do in terms of how long would it take to literally run out of fertile soil in different regions around the world, well, if you consult the UN's global soil database, uh, we tend to have about a half a meter to a meter, about one to three feet of soil on most hillsides in most parts of the world. And I'm going to distinguish hillsides from floodplains for a reason that will become more apparent in a moment. Um, but if you take those upland soils um, and you erode them away at a millimeter a year or so, it only takes 500 years to 1,000 years to quite literally erode through the full stock of soil. I think that's what happened in Syria, that's what happened in Libya, that's what happened in Greece, that's what happened in central um, Italy. It happened in society after society around the world, and one of the problems was is it happened slowly. But it played out over time in ways that undercut the ability of those societies to feed themselves. And we're not going to be able, we're, we're, we simply can't afford to repeat that pattern on a global scale. And if you think about the, the civilizations that actually had 
prospered or survived for thousands of years as agricultural civilizations, most of them tend to be in the major river floodplains of the world, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Nile, the Indus and the Brahmaputra, the rivers of lowland China. What do those, all those systems have in common? They receive sediment that's deposited, that's eroded off their upland areas. They receive fresh soil year after year. So you actually can erode them and maintain their fertility over the long run because there's an extra recharge term. What happens if you look upstream from those environments? In the Zagros Mountains in Iran, it's not productive anymore. The eastern end of Tibet is not very productive anymore. The soil's gone. Somalia and Ethiopia in the headwaters of the Nile is not very productive anymore. Um, so the case that I would like to make is that the numbers kind of pencil out. Whether you're looking at the archaeological data or you're looking at modern soil erosion data, the numbers pencil out that the argument that soil erosion and degradation actually influence the longevity of ancient civilizations is not a crazy hypothesis to advance. Um, the, the numbers kind of pencil out in terms of an order of magnitude. And as a geologist, I find that very satisfying because typically when we get to within a factor of two, we think we're doing great. Um, and this is not exactly news. Uh, back um, in 1937, in the aftermath of the, uh, the Dust Bowl that so um, ravaged the American heartland, um, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, recognized this when he wrote that a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. And I would argue that that argument is as pertinent today on a global scale as it was when FDR made it back in the 1930s. And I also wanted to show you this slide because this is a very famous photograph that is actually part of South Dakota. And I put it on the cover of the Dirt Book. And years later, when I was starting to look at, well, how could we turn this around and address the question of, is soil restoration possible? Can we reverse the historical pattern? One of the first places I came was back to South Dakota to visit Dwayne Beck at Dakota Lakes Research Farm. And why did I do that? I had been speaking at a conference about this, the sort of look back through history, and Dwayne gave a talk about what he was doing at his farm. And I was so impressed that, uh, with what he had been doing and the results that he'd been able to achieve that I wanted to go talk to him and see his example of places when I started writing what became the third book in this trilogy. Um, and as I'll describe later, he took me on a several hundred mile drive around the, the region around his farm up near Pierre, and I only saw three plowed fields in tillage season. Almost everyone had gone no-till. The problem of essentially blowing dust had been solved in that area by going to no-till. And he'd also adopted other methods that I'll talk a little bit more about a little later. But um, one of the reasons I wanted to show you that photograph was just my own thinking has been greatly shaped by what I've both seen in the historical record from the Dakotas, but also what I've seen in terms of people turning this problem around and starting to solve it. But I also learned about the power of soil restoration from my wife in my own garden, well, her garden in our lot. Um, I wrote The Hidden Half of Nature with Anne, um, and she was the driving force. She's a biologist, I'm a geologist. We started thinking about how could we restore our soil uh, when we bought a house in urban North Seattle, and it came with a yard that was covered with a lawn. And ever since we'd, we'd been in graduate school, we'd had apartments. We had little places where just a little patch of earth. She really wanted a gar to make a garden um, because she just pined for that for years. She has a green thumb. I call her the plant whisperer. I have a brown thumb. Um, but I'm capable of following her directions in the yard, and so things work out. Um, Basically, we peeled off that lawn, which I like to call an old-growth lawn, an old-growth Seattle lawn, because it had been there for 90 years. It had about six inches of ratty roots underneath it. And when we peeled that off, we found this incredibly rich black topsoil that the Northwest is known for. <laughs> yeah, no, we found glacial till. Uh, we found basically nature's concrete. We live in a part of the country that was overridden by an ice sheet back about 15,000 years ago that had scraped off pieces of Canada off the British Columbia coast ranges, bulldozed it down to the Puget Lowland, dropped it out in front of the glacier, and then ran over it with a mile-high wall of ice, compacting it. This is not a recipe for really fertile soil. We had the geology part, plenty of mineral stuff in our soil. What we didn't have was the biology. We didn't have the life, whether existing or dead. We just did not have the biology. Uh, and y you might ask, well, why didn't I dig a soil pit and before I bought the house to try and see what was in the yard? At which point I'll say, I don't know, I probably should have. <laughs> just never thought about it. I've done that all over the world. I never thought to do it in a city. 
Um, so what happened is that we decided that we needed to basically try and bring the biology to our soil because we only had half the recipe for fertile soil, half that marriage of geology and biology. And we, we did this in an urban setting by doing things like um, raking up our neighbor's leaves and bringing them back to our lot. You'd be surprised how welcoming your neighbors are when you show up with a... With a um, uh, with, with a rake and basically volunteer to rake their leaves up and take them away from them. Uh, we also t used coffee grounds in the back. Uh, you know, there's plenty of coffee shops in Seattle. They all throw their coffee grounds out the back after work, in part because gardeners come and take it away. Um, it's a really rich source of nitrogen. So we basically tried to find all the sources of organic matter we could, and we composted and mulched our yard uh, quite intensively for years. We started composting our kitchen scraps. We started keeping a worm bin, all the kind of things that you could think of to do to try and um, restore some biology to our soils. And we were really quite surprised at how fast we started to rebuild soil because we recall we started with till pretty much to the surface. Uh, and this shows you about five years into the experiment of um, trying to restore the soil in our yard. Those are Ann's pruning shears over there on the right. It's a profile. Once I, we finally got around to digging a soil pit, when we started seeing the color of our soil change and go from that khaki color to a much sort of a deeper milk chocolate. Uh, and this is about five years in. You'll notice that there's all the sort of uh, wood and leaf, uh, wood chips and leaves up at the top. Uh, but there's, and there's that till down at the bottom. It's, you know, we didn't, we didn't rototill, we didn't dig, we basically just started layering organic matter on the top. Uh, and we had about two inches of soil after about five years that just was not there to begin with. And this really impressed me because if I, you know, what I was taught in graduate school was it took about 500 years for nature to make an inch of soil. Um, and here, Anne had been doing two inches in five years. That's what, uh, four inches in a decade, that's over a meter in a century. And to a geologist, that's no time at all. And so I started thinking, like, wow, what could we really do? Now, about uh, 10 years into it, this is the soil that we have in our yard. In my right hand over there, on your left-hand side, that's the soil that we started with. We still have some that we didn't touch that's underneath the embayment in front of the, under the front window. Less than a half a percent organic matter. The stuff on the right is what we have in our planting beds, uh, and that's about 8% to 10%, depending on where you measure it. It's a complete transformation in a little over a decade. We were able to increase their soil organic matter content between about a half a percent and a percent a year. Our lot is now a net exporter of organic matter. So instead of raiding coffee shops to grab their coffee grounds, we're basically contributing to our municipal composting effort because we're growing more than we need on site to actually um, continue building up the soil. So this got Ann and I interested in how does this all work? And that led us to the world of microbial ecology because it turns out that the microbes, the soil life, were doing all the work in the yard. We were bringing the organic matter in and laying it on the surface, but they were doing the hard labor of actually turning, the, breaking that material down and turning it into um, products that the plants could actually take up and benefit their health. And one of the keys that really helped explain to us how this worked was, again, something that we were not taught in our college education, and that is that when you look at the root system of a plant and you look at the zone around the roots, the rhizosphere, the zone of life around the roots of a plant, um, it, we like to think of it as a living halo. It's one of the most life-dense areas on the planet, around the roots of plants. And the thing that we learned that shed sort of new light on this for us was that root systems are not just straws that suck up nutrients out of the soil to nourish plants. They also push nutrients out of the roots and into the soil. And this doesn't really make any sense when you think about a plant putting 30 to 40 percent of the, ma of the matter that it b makes through the magic of photosynthesis and they just push it out into the soil. I usually ask this question of, you know, how many people in the audience take 40 percent of their income and just go leave it on a street corner somewhere? Nobody? Yeah, so far I haven't found anyone who does that. So why would plants do this? Why would they basically be pushing out so much nutrition into the soil? Uh, and why would they, you know, why would so many of them do them in so many different settings? They've got to be deriving some kind of an advantage from it. And what they're basically doing is they're feeding the microbial life in the soil. They're feeding the fungi and the bacteria. And they're putting out um, carbohydrates, they're putting out proteins, they're putting out hormones, they're putting out lipids, fats we know now from a study of a few uh, months ago. Um, and this really blew our minds in terms of thinking that, hey, these plants are actually trying to feed the microbial life in the rhizosphere. And if plants are doing this, and if they've been doing this since plants colonized the, the land, because the earliest fossil plants that we know of have mycorrhizal fungi intertwined with the roots, the kind of partnerships between plants and soil microbes go way back in geologic time, how, why would this be so widespread um, 
through, through nature. And basically, we came to see the rhizosphere as what we call a biological bazaar. It's sort of a trading zone where microbes and plants are trading nutrients and metabolites and exudates. The plants are putting out exudates into the soil, those black lines in terms of essentially nutrients that they're pumping into the soil. And they don't make it very far. They make it about a millimeter to a, to a centimeter away from the tips of plant roots before they're consumed by an organism. And what do all organisms do that consume things? They transform them, they metabolize them, and then they produce metabolites, otherwise known as waste products. But I think waste product is probably the wrong word to use because those metabolites can actually be inputs to other organisms um, and be actually very useful resources. And what we have an example here of are symbioses between, which, between plants and the microbes that live in the soil, the fungi and the bacteria that live in soils, because those microbes and their metabolites are producing things like plant growth promoting hormones, they're producing chemical signals that actually tee up responses in the plants in terms of making defensive compounds. Uh, these relationships are involved in nutrient acquisition for the plants. Those mycorrhizal fungi that can essentially partner with plants are acting as root extensions that can extend out into the soil and mine very particular elements out of mineral particles. Phosphorus, for example. They can just nab phosphorus out, bring it back to a plant and trade it for what? Well, for a cut of those sugary exudates. The plants are feeding the fungi and the bacteria, and they're getting something in return. It's, it's essentially a symbiotic style of relationships between communities of organisms in the soil and communities of plants. And, and I got very interested in what this actually means for how we think about soil fertility. Because it turns out that if you can think about sort of two very different kinds of soils, one with an organic, a depleted organic matter to which you add a lot of the macro um, nutrients that plants need, things that we call fertilizers like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Um, and when you do that to plants, they put less energy into developing their root system. And if you develop less of a root system, they are producing fewer exudates and you're basically feeding different kinds of uh, organisms in the soil or not as many organisms in the soil. And you don't get as many of the beneficial microbial metabolites that are being produced by those, the soil life in the rhizosphere. On the other hand, if you're growing plants in an organic matter-rich environment, the plants will put out more and deeper roots. They produce more metabolites. They can probably get a, a, an adequate supply of the macronutrients, uh, but they'll be getting more micronutrients and more beneficial microbial metabolites. And we think that there's something here to the idea that if you're growing plants on, uh, in, nutrient de in depleted soils on a fertilizer diet, um, you may be able to maintain yields, but what's in the crop may be different, and the health of that crop may be different, and it may be more vulnerable to pests and pathogens. Um, the, the other thing that we looked at in the hidden half of nature are the parallels with what goes on in the root system of plants in the rhizosphere and what happens in the human gut. Because it turns out, if you look at the human gut and our relationship with the microbes that live within us, it's the same system as the rhizosphere inside out. This, the parallels are actually scary. They're, they're very clear. We go into that in the hidden half of nature. I'll spare you that tonight because you know I'm a professor. I could talk till midnight if I really keep going on all this. Um, but if you're interested in the human microbiome and those relationships, I mean, I never imagined I'd stand in front of an audience and basically say, yeah, you're, 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 your gut, your colon is basically the plant root system inside out and actually mean it. Um, but what does this all mean uh, in terms of you know, our view of soil fertility, in terms of feeding the world of the future? We face a reality today that um, you know, the human population is projected to expand globally by you know, a third to a half again over the next few decades, much of that population growth being uh, centered in Africa. Um, you look at most of the developed world, and if you know, aside from immig immigration, population is not really rising. If you look at Africa, though, uh, most of the projected increase in the human population is going to be on the African continent for the next few decades. What can we do to essentially try and preserve our ability, enhance our ability to feed the world into the future, particularly in a world where at some point we're going to be running low or lower on oil and the, the fossil fuels that we use to drive agriculture today. And you know, we can argue about when, the, when peak oil is or was, and we can argue about what's going to happen to supplies in the future, but I think that the simple reality is, is as we start burning through and going farther down the production curve, the price of those inputs is going to go up. We may never run out of oil. I think you know, arguing that we're going to run out of oil is kind of scaremongering, because the more expensive it gets, the harder people will look for it and the more we'll find. The operative thing, in my view, for agriculture is that as it becomes scarcer, it will become more expensive. 
and it'll be harder to actually use as the foundation for our agricultural system. We need to, in other words, I'm arguing that agriculture is going to change over the next hundred years. The real question is how it's going to do so and in what style it's gonna, uh, that's going to play out. And I'll argue to you, that, and, and argue to anybody really, that rebuilding soil fertility would actually be really useful for sustaining agriculture in a post-cheap oil and fertilizer world. Whether that happens next year or 100 years from now, whenever we get to it, we, are going to, it, we would be very well served if we were able to restore fertility to that one-third of global crop global cropland that has already been taken out of production and to restore the full native fertility of the rest of the world's agricultural soils. And that's what I tried to tackle in the Growing a Revolution book. And, you know, as a geologist, um, I basically decided that my job wasn't to basically tell people how to do this. My job was to go listen to farmers who had already done it and to basically look at the experiments that had been done around the world by farmers who had regenerated the fertility of their soils, rebuilt the product productivity of their land, and try and then stand back and go, what are the common elements that underlie the experiments that have been successful in different parts of the world? And so what I did is I visited farms around the world that had rebuilt the health of their soils, and I saw that how adopting all three principles of the system known as conservation agriculture could match conventional yields using far less oil and chemical inputs. Now, what do I mean by conservation agriculture? Well, in the demonstration outside before this, you basically heard those basic principles because those principles are essentially minimal or no disturbance of the soil, so direct planting of seeds or no-till agriculture. Uh, it's maintaining a permanent ground cover to reduce... Um, soil erosion and to pr promote infiltration, retaining crop residues on the surface, um, and including cover crops and rotations so that uh, the ground is covered at all times. So you cut down on that rilling problem I showed you from eastern Washington. And growing more diverse rotations, to both to maintain fertility and enhance that, and also to break up uh, the path pathogen carryover problem. So there's three elements, minimal disturbance, permanent ground cover, um, or cover crops, and diverse rotations were the common elements that were behind the practices of the successful farmers I visited around the world in Africa, Central America, and across North America. And why didn't I go to Asia? I ran out of money. Simple answer, <laughs> my, I exhausted my budget and I had to stop and publish the book. Um, but what did I learn in the process? I learned things about, you know, things like uh, no-till planters that you don't get taught in geology graduate school. Um, and I'll spare you the details of sort of how this works, but uh, the, um, the Ohio farmer David Brandt there is modeling it for you in terms of something that cuts a narrow trench in the soil, you drop a seed and then cover it back up. What I want to really show you is over there on the right, that's a freshly planted field. Compare that in your mind's eye to what you get after the passage of a plow, what you saw in eastern Washington with a freshly plowed field. This field is actually fully covered with an organic dressing. It has a layer of mulch across it. You could rain on that and it won't erode. And it's ju literally been planted seconds before I took that photograph. Um, if we look at te and the, the sort of technological innovations that um, allow us to do no-till planting like what I just showed you, we can also think of technological innovations uh, that can help us with, with cover crops. And one of my favorites is the, the crop roller that um, Jeff Moyer and the Rodale Institute have been, been um, and, uh, developing and promoting as a way to essentially terminate cover crops uh, and a way to essentially manage um, cover crops um, as mulch and to essentially uh, help also with weed suppression in terms of, of uh, how they're integrated into um, crop rotations and cover crop management. So the first stop on my tour actually to visit farmers around the world was Dwayne Beck and, and Dakota Lakes Farm. And why was that? Well, I'd met him, as I mentioned earlier, at a conference we were both speaking at. I saw him speak about his farm and I was like, I have to go talk to that guy. If I'm actually gonna finish, take this project on, I've got to go talk to him and learn what he knows. And it was an incredible visit. It was very educational for me. Um, and I was really impressed with what he had done in terms of starting with a, going to no-till and then um, going into cover crops and then finally into diversifying his rotations. And now he's talking about bringing livestock back onto the farm. Um, I thought it was a real example for how we should be thinking about setting up demonstration farms all around the country to investigate what kinds of innovative practices can lead to that could be of direct benefit to farmers. And why I would argue that is that what he basically showed me is that through adopting no-till cover crops and complex rotations, those three components of conservation agriculture, he, they were able to greatly reduce their inputs of diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide, while at the same time not maintaining but increasing their crop yields. And if you think about a recipe for farm profitability, if you can spend less to grow more, that's a pretty nice recipe. 
Um, and he introduced me to, to farmers in the region that uh, had been successful uh, adopting this. And their practices also allowed them from going from a, um, a wheat fallow system, where you only used half of your fields per year, to something where you're, the whole farm was in production every year. That's a huge economic benefit. Um, I came away very impressed, and I asked him, hey, this is great. This is, you know, you've shown me farms uh, from a few thousand acres to 20,000 acres in the Dakotas that have worked. Could you do this on small subsistence farms in Africa? And Dwayne told me, well, don't ask me. Go ask Kofi Boa. He's already done it. Uh, and Kofi Bo is this gentleman here on the right. I love his got dirt, get soil hat. <laughs> He's got the right idea. Um, and he, he runs the No-Till Research Center in, in, near Kumasi in Ghana. Um, and he's basically transformed the agriculture of the region around his village. Um, and the way that they practice cover cropping and a diversity is actually by growing a diversity of crops in the field all at once. So if you go to their fields, they'll have, you'll notice there's no bare soil. Basically, the ground is, co is covered with a mulch from previous crops. But there's also three or four and up to eight crops in the field at any one time. So they've got, you know, pretty much everything is edible in their fields. They're, he's, they're not growing cover crops as a cover crop. They're growing cover crops to eat, and they, the organic matter accumulates because they don't eat the whole plant. Um, and what he's basically done is he's taken the, the, the subsistence farmers in the area around his village from their traditional slash and burn uh, approach to growing uh, with no-till and cover crops in a generation. They've basically skipped over the Green Revolution. And why would they do that? Well, these farmers had not participated in the Green Revolution. They don't have any money. They don't have any resources to buy fertilizer. They, have, they buy a little bit of herbicide, but they can't afford to buy much. They can't afford to buy patented seeds. Um, what they have is their labor, and they have little bits of land. And what he basically was able to do is shut erosion down. You notice the traditional erosion rate is about 20 times higher than that, the no-till with the cover crops. Uh, they had horrible soil erosion problems when they were doing their traditional slash and burn because their population had grown enough that they could no longer rotate through different patches of forest. They were basically continually cropping the same pieces of ground year after year and burning it, and they'd taken their soil organic matter from 4 or 5% in the native forest, which is actually pretty good in the tropics, down to less than 1%. Um, and Kofi, the techniques Kofi taught them basically reduced that erosion, but it also, look what it did to their yields. It tripled their corn yield and it doubled their cowpea yields. This is as good or better than the Green Revolution did in the developing world. And this didn't involve any chemical inputs. It was a change in thinking, a change in practices, a change in the way they managed their land, and it was transformative. Ten years before I visited their village, nobody in the village owned their home. Kofi was relating to me that now almost everybody owns their own home. The economic transformation was sort of the first step in the road to sustainable development, was basically increasing their yields enough so that they were not just feeding themselves, but they had a marketable surplus. Uh, I also visited some other farmers across North America, Gabe Brown over there on the left from North Dakota, um, and um, uh, David Brandt over there on the right. I like to show these guys together because they have very different conceptions of what their livestock is. Um, Gabe Brown is, has been experimenting with uh, reintroducing uh, uh, cattle and chickens onto his cropping operation and has a big grazing operation. Uh, he'll also tell you that a lot of his livestock is microscopic and underground, but when you go visit David Brandt, he tells you that's all his livestock. He does not have livestock on his land. What he feeds them are his cover crops. And that daikon radish that he's holding uh, would sell for an astronomical amount in the farmer's market in Seattle, if he could get it there, um, but David doesn't want to sell them. That's the food for his microbes. That's what he feeds his subterranean livestock. He's a, he's a commodity corn and soy producer. Those are his cash crops. But he actually plants very diverse fields of cover crops in between his crops. And in that picture on the right, I want to point out that field across the road past that car, all that, that yellow stuff, that's his neighbor's conventional soybeans. The green stuff in that field in the background, that's glyphosate-resistant mare's tail. It's not a crop. Up to a third of his neighbor's fields are covered with that stuff. There's a real problem with weed suppression in that region. You know how many weeds I saw on David Brandt's farm? None. He plants them. He calls them cover crops. He plants them in between his main crops. And then he terminates them, and he basically uses them to draw mineral elements out of the subsoil, get it into the soil, and start it in the biological recycling that's microbially mediated that breaks it down and makes it available to his plants. So he's basically harnessed weeds in effect. 
uh, and plants a diversity of them and has integrated them into his practices. What's it done for the, for the fertility of his land and the, the bottom line, the economics of his farm? I like to share his story on this because he sort of walked me through the whole story of comparing the county average of his neighbors to his operation. And basically the, the county average was uh, full tillage um, with adding 200 pounds of nitrogen a year and two and a half quarts of Roundup per acre of farmland. Uh, and this is back in 2015 when I was researching the book. And you'd be uh, sort of surprised at how slow the publishing process is to actually get a book out the door. Um, but the total cost to, to his neighbors that year it came to about 500 bucks an acre. And that year, corn was about four yield a bushel from what they were getting. Um, and at 100 bushels an acre for the, the county average yield, that means that they were losing about 100 bucks an acre on average. That's a terrible business model. And as I was research, as I was putting the, the book together in the final throws, I ran into a paper, I think it was also from 2015, that 25% of the farmers in the state of Iowa, I believe it was, lost money on every acre they planted that year. Something is terribly wrong with our agricultural system if farmers working some of the best agricultural land in the world lose money the harder they work. In contrast, and I think it's something is terribly wrong with our soil, um, is the, the answer there. David Brandt's been doing no-till for 44 years, uh, a few decade or so ago, maybe 15 years ago. I forget the actual numbers. That's why you write them down in a book. You don't have to remember them. You can just tell people to look them up later. Um, he went, uh, added cover crops to his rotations, and he's been diversifying his cover crops. He's still growing corn and soy as his cash crops, but he's got a very diverse mix of plants in his cover crop mix, up to, you know, on average 12 and up to 18, I think he was doing, um, uh, in a planting. And he's doing no tillage at all. Uh, he's using about 24 pounds of nitrogen per acre and about one quart of Roundup. And I want to emphasize that um, only one of the farms I visited on this tour of farms around the world was an organic farm. And that was the Rodale Institute to ask them, can you do no-till organically? And they said, yes, they can. But they had to do a little plowing every now and then to beat those perennial weeds down. Um, and most of the farmers that I visited were conventional farmers who I came to term organic-ish farmers because after they restored the health of their soil, they were able to so reduce the reliance on inputs that they were hardly using any at all. Um, and as, this, as um, David Brandt's example showed, he's using about an eighth of the nitrogen, about a fifth of the Roundup. You know, that's revolutionary in terms of his input costs. Uh, so he was spending about $320 an acre, uh, and his yield was about 80% above the county average that year. Was a, I believe it was a relatively dry year, and this kind of a system does tend to do better than conventional in drier years. And at that $4 bushel market price, he was getting basically a $400 per acre profit compared to his neighbor's $100 per acre loss. That's a really good economic model. And that started when I started hearing the same kind of story that when soil fertility had been restored, soil health had been rebuilt, the input costs went way down, yet the yields didn't suffer much after a transition period. Um, this gave me some um, uh, optimism, cause for optimism, that these kind of style of farming that could rebuild soil fertility might catch on. Because if there's one thing that's necessary is that for farmers to stay in business, they have to remain as a profitable business. Otherwise, it's just not going to work over the long run. Um, and Brandt's example gave me some optimism. Well, and the others, too. Uh, Gabe Brown's example, uh, Kofi's example. Uh, the economics for people who had adopted this full system of conservation agriculture seemed to work out pretty well over the long run. Now, Gabe Brown likes to show you his soil. He says the most valuable tool on a farm is a shovel. I agree completely with him. We went around to his neighbor's farms digging holes, and we dug holes all over his farm. And he basically is a very big believer in cover crops, as he's showing off to a group of farmers over there on the right with sort of a diversity of crops. But he's also been experimenting with re integrating animal husbandry into his operation. He basically brings cattle in to graze off his market garden and the cover crops that are in there, his crops and his cover crops, and then he has chickens that follow the, the cattle around to essentially eat the fly larvae that are in the manure, and, and basically he's using his livestock as a way to accelerate the breakdown of organic matter, and he's also developed a sort of profitable side business in, in um, selling meat in Bismarck. What really impressed me, though, was the soil. I mean, I'm a geologist, right? I love cows. I love chickens. Uh, I like crops, but I was really interested in his soil. And this shows you the example of his soil versus his neighbor's soil. His neighbor's farm uh, that we're comparing here is an organic farm. It's been organic for a long time, but it's plow-based. It's a tillage-based organic farm. So guess which one of those two is Gabe's soil, and which is his organic neighbor's soil? Gabe is not an organic farmer. He'll still use chemicals when he needs to. He just doesn't find the need to use very many of them very often. His soil is that black stuff on the right. You, you, you basically compare them. It's like night and day. 
One is very, uh, a very rich, very fertile soil. Um, the other is a degraded organic soil um, or a degraded soil that has been managed organically. Um, and one of the key things that I learned out of researching this book, and I really will emphasize in the book, is that many of the arguments that we tend to have about um, conventional agriculture versus organic agriculture, they get cast in a whole different light when you think through the lens of soil health, because neither one of those really map onto degrading soil or building soil. It's different, and these principles of conservation agriculture can actually help build soil fertility in both organic systems and in conventional systems. And so I was challenged at one point by my wife and by my editor to basically uh, come up with a catchphrase uh, that captures the, the spirit of conservation agriculture. And I, frankly, I don't remember which parts of this Anne came up with and which parts I came up with, but what we landed on was ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity as the simplest phrased advice we could give to farmers around the world in terms of how to implement conservation agriculture. Now you'll notice that there's nothing specific about how to do any of those. These are broad principles. These are the kind of things that worked across the board for the farmers that I visited. And the way you would do this in Ghana would be really different than the way you would do it in the Dakotas. Um, the idea is to try and take these general principles and figure out ways to tailor and adapt it to different environments around the world, different levels of technological sophistication, different kinds of soils, different kinds of climates, the whole yada, yada, yada of what's different and unique about my farm versus your farm versus their farm. Um, but these principles, I think, are actually fairly transparent and universal, and they have room for bringing in animal agriculture as sort of an add-on and benefit from this, but I saw farms that rebuilt the fertility of their soil without that, um, but I also saw farms where I think that that greatly accelerated it. And this was eye-opening for a geologist who had studied gully erosion in the California foothills uh, and basically documented that when the Spanish arrived with cattle, the gullies cut down to bedrock. They were a horribly destructive force in California. I was incredibly impressed with the ranches that I saw where people were using livestock as a tool of soil restoration and regeneration. And it boiled down to me realizing that, oh, the problem's not the cows. The problem's how we've been managing the cows. And that it was essentially a social and a management issue. Well, what are the benefits of conservation agriculture? Uh, you know, comparable or increased yields, that's important going forward. We can't afford to go to styles of agriculture that lower our yields greatly. Um, it reduced fossil fuel fertilizer and pesticide use. Those are all of benefit um, for multiple reasons, not the least of which is the lower cost to the farmer, but also to the lower pollution that's produced off-site. Uh, they can increase uh, soil carbon, uh, both in terms of building up soil fertility and also for carbon sequestration. Um, they also increase water retention and therefore crop resilience. You saw an excellent demonstration of that in the, the lead in, in introduction to this talk. Um, but they also result in higher farmer profits from lower input costs that maintain yields over the long run, that's a recipe for wider adoption and for, for better farm economics. And I actually think that we should be pursuing policies at a national level that really prioritize rebuilding soil health as sort of a natural infrastructure project that could help build and keep wealth in rural communities across America by keeping more of our farm dollars actually on the farm. So what does this mean uh, more philosophically? I, you know, speaking at a university and as a professor, I'll engage in a, in a bit of, of history for a few minutes. Uh, I think we're at the, the cusp of a new revolution in agricultural philosophy. If we look back through the four revolutions in um, uh, agriculture we've had to date, the first was the idea of cultivation and tillage in the first place. That was revolutionary. It started us on the path to where not all of us have to farm to feed ourselves. Um, as we talked earlier in the talking about the dirt book, the, the embrace of uh, tillage-based agriculture came with serious downsides over the long haul, um, but it was really the first agricultural revolution. The second was the recognition of, of uh, soil husbandry, the idea of uh, putting legumes in crop rotations, um, uh, using planting cover crops. It, societies around the world independently discovered this for themselves because it helped bolster soil fertility. Um, and that quote from Leonardo up there is about as true today as it was 500 years ago. And think about the rest of science. How many areas of science can you say that about? We still, the, we still have a lot to learn about soil science and the role of soil ecology in soil fertility. The third agricultural revolution in the way that I keep score on these things, and most academics have their own scoreboard for these kind of things, so you know, if you disagree, that's fine. Um, the third revolution, in my view, is, was mechanization and industrialization uh, that happened that brought in sort of the modern fertilizer industry and the mechanization of farm implements and the replacement of, of animals and animal husbandry and its displacement off of farms. Um, and that gentleman up in the upper right, Justice von Liebig, is a very interesting character. He's the person who is widely regarded as the godfather of the modern fertilizer industry. 
But what hardly anybody knows is that he wrote a book near the end of his life, 23 years after he wrote the book that sort of introduced the idea of adding particular chemical elements to farm fields to fertilize our crops. He wrote a book that basically cast his view of how to sustain agriculture in completely different light. It's called The Natural Laws of Husbandry, and it, it basically is Liebig reflecting on a career in both chemistry and agriculture, where he recommended that the way to sustain agricultural uh, production, to sustain soil fertility over the long run, was to return organic matter to the fields. Because if we didn't do that, we wouldn't be providing a full complement of nutrients to our crops. And he was sort of the first person that recognized the overarching need to sort of close the loop in terms of nutrient cycling. Somehow we have to rebuild or replace the fertility of our land as fast as we're degrading it. Uh, otherwise, we're going to essentially wear it down. Um, this is something that I think that uh, very few people sort of recognize in the history of agriculture in terms of how different a perspective Liebig ended his life with than what he's famous for. The fourth agricultural revolution, really, I mean, you got to point to the green revolution and biotechnology, the sort of the late half of the 20th century in terms of uh, the modernization of our agricultural technologies. Um, you know, and, and wheat yields in developed countries, as shown there in that graph, were doubled as a result of the green revolution. Um, you know, crop yields went up in the 20th century um, without question. The challenge that I think we face today is thinking through, well, what are we going to do next? Can we actually continue doing more of the same and expect to see comparable results, or do we have to think through a different filter and think differently about the future of agriculture? And of course, I'm arguing that the next agricultural revolution will be thinking about soil health and thinking of recasting the way that we think about farming practice, the way we think about soil, through the lens of thinking, how can we build soil fertility as a consequence of intensive agriculture, rather than mining it as we have done in the past? And to do that, basically, I, will, I would argue, we need to combine the best of modern technology with the best of ancient wisdom. The ideas of crop rotations and cover crops um, are not new ideas. These are ideas that were discovered independently in societies around the world because they help bolster soil fertility. What we need to do today is marry them with the technologies that allow us to practice no-till and to minimize soil disturbance and get all three elements of conservation agriculture working together. Because um, the, the, the farms I visited and the studies that I've reviewed, the few studies there are of those whole system of practices really point to a, a, a synergistic effect of adopting all three of those elements. And why do they work? Because you're essentially cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. You're not disking up and plowing up the mycorrhizal fungi. You're basically feeding um, carbon and nitrogen to the soil, which essentially acts as currency in the underground food web. Um, and you're basically um, uh, not creating opportunities for pests and pathogens by diversifying crop rotations. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize that this is not really the question of, you know, in terms of the future of agriculture, of a low-tech organic approach versus a high-tech or agrotech or GMO approach. Um, you know, we're, I think, really talking about a third dimension to the, the arguments that we tend to have on the two, that two-dimensional plane. Uh, it's really, I think, about understanding how we can um, apply soil ecology to the problem of sustaining, if not increasing, crop yields in a post-oil, low-input world. I think the key there is thinking about soil ecology and trying to actually work with the microorganisms that are in the soil to benefit our farmers and our productive capacity. And if we look at soil through that lens, we come to a very different set of, um, of, of thinking about the way that we should be conducting agriculture. Because if you look at the dominant sort of paradigm for 20th century agriculture in the developed world, it was intensive tillage, intensive uh, chemical use, and monocultures, growing one or two key things. If you look at the principles of conservation agriculture, they flip all three of those completely on their head 180 degrees to basically stop plowing, always keep the ground covered with cover crops and to you know, basically use biological methods to fix a lot of nitrogen, um, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it, and actually diversify up crop rotations. It's a 180 degree philosophical shift and it doesn't involve any particular product. It is a switch in practices that could lead us there, I would argue. What are the be potential benefits from uh, enhancing soil health, I think it would really help us with, with some of the really big challenges of the 21st century. Of course, the idea of feeding the world and not just doing it for the next couple decades, but how we're going to do it for the next few centuries as we play out in the post-oil world, however that plays out. Um, we can also help us actually park a lot of carbon in the ground. Uh, there's wildly varying estimates about how much carbon we could actually park in the world's agricultural soils, but even the low-end estimates are a lot. Not enough to solve the atmospheric CO2 problem, um, but in my view at least, but enough to make a serious dent in it. And 
we could, should be doing it simply to maintain the fertility of our land in the first place. The practices you would adopt are identical. Um, it could also help with environmental degradation. If we look at uh, the biodiversity loss on the continents, for example, the future of what happens on farmland is a big piece of the biodiversity uh, problem because farmland accounts for a quarter of the continents. You know, what we do on farms in the future is going to have a big effect on who we continue to share this planet with in terms of the, the animal and plant worlds. And uh, importantly, I think that uh, rebuilding soil health can actually help restore farm profitability. This is something I hadn't really been aware of when I started doing the interviews uh, for Growing a Revolution, but what I heard in story after story of farmers who had adopted these practices and maintained them over time was that it had worked out pretty well for them. There were rough spots, of course, as there always is in any transformation, um, but that it had worked. And that gave me some optimism that the short-term incentives for farmers are starting to align with the long-term interests of society as a whole at maintaining the fertility of our soils. So I think we have a major natural infrastructure project that faces us as a species in terms of rebuilding the fertility of our land, but it's one of the most important investments humanity could make in our own future, I think, is rebuilding the fertility of our agricultural land. And therein, I think we have opportunities to try and build coalitions between the developed and developing world, between rural states and urban states, uh, we really all have a stake in this. And I can't really think of a great rationale for not at least trying to experiment and push these ideas forward to the extent that they're able to. Is it going to solve all of our problems? No. But it could really help with a whole basket full of them. And Basically, I will stop there. Uh, naturally, as any author would do, I'd recommend that you read, read my books. Every author is going to tell you that. But anyway, thank you so much for your attention and for the um, invitation to come and address you. It's a pleasure to be back in South Dakota. I've learned an awful lot from, an, from a lot of really cool farmers here. Thank you.